Blessings everyone, and welcome to Stellar Maze. In the last episode, we observed how ancient Ukraine served as a stage for several hordes of conquerors. In the eyes of contemporary historians, these were people of the horse and people of the north. They roamed free and wild, most of them sticking to a nomadic lifestyle, as well as let's harass the Roman Empire until it falls type of lifestyle. It was sometime around 500 to 700 AD that the new people emerged, and these were here to stay, the Slavs. In this part, we'd be looking at how the Kievan Rus came to be, what enemies it had to face, and what fate its people inherited after its fall. As I pointed out in the last episode, Geographia plays a significant role in shaping your cultures and your history. Let's take a closer look. As we go along, you may notice a lot of horse warriors, and that the majority of these are conquerors from the east, Bulgars being one exception. Although they were different cultures, there are three things that they all share in common. The way they fight, the way they move, and the way they rule. All of these can be traced back to their homeland, vast open seas of rolling steppe. Soil around here is not very good at growing food. Meanwhile, the other food first needs to be caught. Oh boy, do those steppe animals love to be fast. It'd be very helpful if you could upgrade your nimble feet to four cutting-edge technology hoofed legs of a model designed specifically for speed. And when those critters are really far away, just learn to shoot really well. You gotta be real sneaky if you want to survive on a step. Many urban cultures, such as the Chinese, have commented on how these nomads have no sense of honor when fighting. While most empires waged war by swords, spears and shields, slings and arrows being a support unit, these horse warriors went all in on ranged missiles and traps. A popular strategy was the feigned retreat, in which the horse warriors would pretend to fall back, leaving behind small rewards to lure the enemy into a trap. Here, being a good trickster was a matter of life and death. Now when it comes to infrastructure, most of these cultures are not known for building cities. First of all, Look at this place. Do you see a lot of stuff for building a thriving civilization? And with the exception of a few places, the soil around here isn't that good for agriculture. As a hunter, while you're trying to catch your Chateaubriand de la Steppe, you need to consider one thing. It keeps moving. So you also gotta move with it. Become a nomad and travel the world. That means it's way harder for the enemy to fight you. No cities to be sacked, no problem. But that also means no fancy drawer, no TV, no pool, only smartphones and other things you can carry with you. Consequently, the less private property you own, the more you start thinking, hey, this guy has something, but it's not like he owns it, I barely even know what that means. Therefore, I am morally obligated to take whatever I need to survive. At last this cascades into politics. If your culture consists of constantly moving nomads, it becomes really hard to build a stable government, to keep them all in control. Sick of paying your taxes? Just run away. How are they going to find you? Much less catch you. And what are they going to threaten you with? You've practically got only your life to lose. It's not like those snarky honchos sitting in their ivory towers know what you're dealing with. You gotta solve your problems on your own. Yes, you'll like being a free and independent warrior of the steppe. And if the government made peace with your neighbor, why do you care? You can continue to raid and pillage to your heart's content. These three areas of how they fight, move, and rule are definitive to how the people of ancient Ukraine had to deal with most of their eastern invaders. When it comes to western ones, the picture becomes different. First of all, there's less of them. The Black Sea kept the Greeks and Romans at a distance, the marshes in the north kept away all the noob conquerors, and at last the Carpathian Mountains straight to the west serve as a giant wall. Meanwhile, the eastern steppes fostered nomadic and free world cultures, gliding through the realms like dust in the wind, people in the west were literally glued to the earth. Good soil means food that you can grow. Food that you can grow means you don't have to move. Not having to move means settling down and eventually building towns and cities. Building towns and cities means laying the foundation for organized polities, like kingdoms. If your entire culture is built on fertile soils, then you would be keen on holding your ground and defending it to your last breath. Passed down from generation to generation, the land itself becomes part of your identity. And if there's really good land next to you, you might get interested in taking that as well. And as I mentioned in the last video, Ukraine has some of the most fertile soils in the world, getting the attention of many curious eyes. When it comes to farming, it gets a bit hard to do it all by yourself without all the combines and tractors. 
so why not call your neighbor Svetoslav to help? Oh, and don't forget about your 26 children. Now, work can be a wholesome family activity bringing the community together to break their backs from dawn to dusk. Unified communities that stay in one spot allow for better organization and more chances to build a strong government. The last environment that I'd like to touch on before I delve into history is the marshland. This is a land that is marshy. It's a little wet, a little miserable, and a little hard to move through and invade. Due to the limited amount of even terrain, it gets hard to grow a lot of food here, much less build anything here. Meanwhile, the prevalence of disease doesn't make it any better. Thus, cultures around here would be fairly meek when compared to others. At the same time, though, the impenetrable marshlands can work as a sort of incubator, protecting small cultures until it is perfect time for them to hatch and rise to power. This was indeed the case with the Slavs. Around 100 AD, when the Huns have not yet arrived in Europe, and Rome was celebrating some of the last of their good emperors, the embryo of a new culture was conceived in the deep marshes just north of the Carpathian Mountains. It would grow and develop for 500 more years, until it was finally brought to light in the European theater. Three brother cultures would emerge. One would follow the sun to the west, becoming an ancestor to the western Slavs. The second would instead approach the sun, becoming the ancestor to the eastern Slavs. Meanwhile, the third would multiply by 100 and ram its way south, displacing all the native barbarians and Romans in their path by sheer numbers. Anyways, through 700 AD, the Slavs continued to multiply and diversify to become the largest ethnic group in Europe, eventually dominating almost half of the continent. In this video, we'll focus most on the Eastern Slavs. As soon as they settled in this rich, black, juicy Chernozem of ancient Ukraine, they realized they didn't want to give it up, and thus started to build fortified towns. These towns would become citadels, organizing the tribes around them under one head. Whereas situated on rivers, many of these would prosper from trade. Not necessarily the largest, but definitely the most influential tribe would be the Palyanians, who would settle upon the large river Dnipro, connecting them to most other tribes. Their city would be called Kiev. Knock knock. Who's there? It's the Khazars. Khazars who? It's a Turkic people. Let's dial back a bit. What is this? The Mongolian Empire? No, you'd be surprised by how much happened here before Genghis Khan. This is the Gokturk Empire, a giant federation of a hundred nomadic tribes. They stretched all the way from China up to Crimea by 576 AD, and acquired wealth through exploiting the Silk Road trade. It was at this time that the word Turk became used to refer to a type of people, meaning something like strong or powerful. Sweet. Anyways, around the second half of the 7th century, no one was feeling it anymore, and the empire started to fall apart. In the west, though, a portion of that empire remained intact and became known as the Khazar Khaganate. They were different from most other Turkic people. You see, they actually built those things called cities. It wasn't just the soil quality that compelled them to settle, but also trade. The Khazars found themselves as a middleman between three worlds. The west really wanted to continue trading with the east and the East really wanted to continue trading with the West. And for good measure, the Norse started realizing they could go down the rivers such as Volga and Don, and also join in. And the Khazars realized that it meant stunks for them. They built cities to help manage trade, as well as manage each other. These were defined by their cultural and religious diversity. Despite all these factors, being situated in the center of things wasn't always beneficial. It meant that you had to look out in every single direction for enemies. In fact, as soon as they became an independent Khaganate, the Khazars had to face off against the expanding Arab Empire to the south. Lucky for them, the Caucasian mountains were very helpful. There were also other Turkic tribes still roaming the wild on horseback, as well as the Slavs and later the Vikings, none of whom were keen on giving the Khazars a rest. Wait, did you say Vikings? I sure did. For comparison, unlike the Khazars, the Scandinavians were left in the corner of the world, surrounded by icy waters that served not only to protect them, but also empower them. In the 8th century, some of the warriors slash merchants started making their way down the rivers, searching for wealth and glory. At this time, the early Slavic settlements were still weak, and were forced to decide whether they would join the Khazar Khaganate, or submit to the Varangians, or the Rus, as they called them. They chose to go with the Khazars. So the Rus had to leave and had a timeout at Lake Ladoga for a little while. 
Eventually, the Slavs became tired of the high taxes they had to pay to the Khazars and came back to the Rus, asking whether they still wanted to rule. Would they ever? Three brothers came down to answer their pleas. In 840, Rurik would settle in Novgorod, Sinyos in Belozera, and Truvor in Izborsk. Under these three Rus chiefs, the Slavs would also become known as the Rus. Eventually, two of the brothers died out somehow, leaving Rurik to become the sole ruler, establishing the Rurik dynasty, which would last for 700 years until the first Russian Tsar, Ivan III. Um, so about that problem with the Khazars. Oh, right. How did I forget? Here, can you wait for like 40 years until my son succeeds me? He would liberate you. It was in 883 that Rurik's son Alech of Novgorod attacked Kiev. I mean, liberated it from the Khazars. If you can remember, that city belonged to the Palyanans, which were the most powerful of the tribes. Now under Alech, they helped in uniting all the other tribes into what would be now known as the Kievan Rus. Alech's son, Igor of Kiev, would invade the Khazar Khaganate twice, but then one tribe known as the Dravilians would assassinate him for his high taxes. That's when they made a fatal mistake. You see, Igor was married to this one interesting lady named Olga. Oh boy, is it hard not to look into her eyes and not see your soul burning. The chronicles would describe how Olga would go on avenging her husband's death by literally incinerating the Trevilians off the face of the earth. She would later be succeeded by her son Svetoslav I, who seemed to inherit some of his mother's fiery character, and would return to fighting the Khazars. By 966, he would destroy the Khazar capital and nearly triple his kingdom in size. Alright, one enemy defeated, one more to go. Wait, one more? There's three, actually. First would come the Pichinyaks, then the Kumans, and eventually those who we all know and love, the Mongols. The Pichinyaks appeared on the stage in the late 9th century, but really came to power as soon as the Khazars went out of picture. They formed their own Khaganate, split into two wings right along the Dnipro River. And although they were technically led under their supreme leaders Kagans, they functioned more as a military democracy. They would at first settle for peace with the Slavs, but would quickly abandon it and turn to pillaging. In 972, they would ambush Svetoslav and kill him with his armies, leaving the Slavic villages up for grabs. Svetoslav's three legendary sons, Yarapolk, Alek, and Vladimir, would vie for power until Vladimir would flee to Norway and return with an army of Rankians, aka Vikings, to win over the throne. He would become best buddies with the Byzantine Emperor Basil II, would marry his sister and adopt Orthodox Christianity, as well as give the Byzantines 6,000 of his Viking warriors to form the famous Varangian Guard in 988. Vladimir would be effective at holding off the Pechenegs, as well as raising his country's infrastructure and economy, becoming known as Vladimir the Great. In 1015, he would be replaced by Usurper, Svetopolk I, aka Svetopolk the Accursed, who would kill Vladimir's sons, all except for one. Yaroslav would come back and overthrow Svetopolk, reasserting the throne of his father, and becoming known as Yaroslav the Wise. He would continue to raise his country's economy as well as spread literacy and education. In 1036, he delivered a powerful blow to the Pechenegs, and in 1037, he built St. Sophia's Cathedral, which serves as a testament to the golden age of his time. Unfortunately, Yaroslav would be known as the last great monarch of the Kiev, and after his death would follow a long period of demise. Welcome in the Kumans, aka Palovtsi, aka the Kipchaks, aka we just pushed out the Pechenegs, but we are friendly. Let's make peace. Psych, how about we raid your lands and sell you as slaves? The Kumans weren't too much different from their Pechenek brethren. They were just stronger and more ruthless. Oh, and they had those pretty cool masks, apparently. The Slavs couldn't really fight back because they were too busy fighting each other. At one point, this guy, Alech of Chernihiv, straight up asked the Kumans to help him in defeating his political rivals. The Kivian Rus was a mess, and several tribes said, screw this, we're making a new country. Roman Mseslavich joined together the lands of Galicia and Volhynia into the aptly named Galicia Volhynia in 1199. These were situated farther away to the northwest, and utilized the more forested and mountainous region to their advantage. For a hundred years they actually had a good rap. They started trading with Western Europe, specifically the Poles and the Hungarians, but their most important partner was the Byzantine Empire to the south. Unfortunately for them, that would not last. 
In the 13th century, the Crusaders just randomly decided to sack Constantinople, which delivered a significant blow to the trade routes. This was shortly followed by the internal unrest from the Bayars and the Magnates in Galicia Volhynia, and eventually Galicia Volhynia was weakened so much that it could not even hope to stand against yet another invader from the eastern steppes. In 1223, the Mongols struck out of the blue with incredible power, and then disappeared as soon as they had come, leaving everyone to wonder what just happened. They would come again in 1236 under Batu Khan, the grandson of Genghis Khan, in a powerful wave known as the Golden Horde. These weren't all purely Mongols, there was a Turkey group that fought alongside them known as the Tatars. After the Mongolian Empire fell apart in the mid-14th century, the Tatars formed their own Crimean Khanate, centered firmly on the Crimean Peninsula. They continued to dominate the Ukrainian steppe until 1783, when they would be annexed by the Russian Empire. Things were no better from the west, neither from the north. Two more invaders established the rule by exploiting a weakened situation, and by 14th century, the land of Ukraine was divided between three powers. The Polish in the west, the Lithuanians in the north, and the Tatars in the southeast. While all this was happening, Something else was brewing up in the north. Something left without watch. Who knows when it first came to be, but in 1147 was the first recorded mention of a tiny, insignificant town called Moscow. Surrounded by forests and marshes and a good walk away from the center of the stage, this little town would lie in the shadows and wait for its time. The early rulers of Moscow would make sure not to piss off the Mongols. In fact, they would even collaborate with them helping to collect taxes from nearby towns. Eventually, the Golden Horde would give their leaders the title of Grand Princes of Moscow. In 1326, under shadowy circumstances, the head of the Orthodox Church was moved to Moscow. In 1327, the Prince of Moscow joined the Mongols and raided the nearby city of Tver, eliminating competition. The last remaining target was the city of Vladimir, which for now maintained the supreme authority in the Russian territory. They had no intention to destroy that city, there were many other ways they could go around it. In 1380, Prince Dmitri gathered his forces and faced off the Golden Horde in the Battle of Kulikova, a major, culturally significant battle that liberated the Russian people from their Mongol overlords. Not really, it just shifted the center of authority from Vladimir to Moscow. The Golden Horde, and later the Crimean Khanate, continued to demand tribute for 100 more years until Ivan III, aka Ivan the Great, consolidated Russian states into one kingdom and fought the horse warriors off their lands. Ivan would go on to proclaim himself as a Tsar of Russia, coming from the word Caesar, seeing Moscow as the new Rome, and in 1480 he would go so far as to claim supremacy over all the Russes, which included Kiev as well. The Polish and the Lithuanians decided to team up in 1385 to face the perils of the East and West back to back. This bond was strengthened in 1569 to make the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. They technically functioned as two autonomous countries, having their own laws and their own cultures, but their sovereign was one, and if one side got in a mess, the other would help it. Unlike Russia or the Kievan Rus, the Polish and Lithuanians sided with the Catholic Church and had more ties to the Western politics. The Polish practiced feudalism, which was where the monarch would grant lands to his nobles, and the nobles would grant portions of their lands to smaller nobles, and the smaller nobles would grant portions of their lands to peasants, who had to work and pay taxes if they wanted to live on it. With time, unfortunately, this regime was becoming more and more corrupt. The peasant taxes were raised higher and higher, and the nobles even started to insurf them. When a peasant becomes a serf, he has less rights, if any at all, and becomes practically the master's property that could be sold or bought, like a slave. Things under the Lithuanians were slightly softer, and they were not as tyrannical, but through an enduring relationship with the Polish, they gradually absorbed many of the influences. A lot of peasants and Serbs were getting progressively sick of it and succumbed to abandoning their lands to flee into the wild and unregulated lands to the southeast, the lands of the horse nomads. The soup of the Slavic and Turkic influence would boil for a decade or two, until at last we get the Kazakhs. 
there were many different types of Kazakhs that evolved at their own time, under their own circumstances. So I think it'd be best to dedicate a separate video to observing that. In this video, I'm looking at the Kazakhs of Ukraine in the 15th to 17th century. The word Kazakh probably originates from the Turkic Kazakh, meaning adventurer or freeman. A free-willed and militant people, they quickly organized into large groups and campaigned against the Tatars and other Turkic settlements. Beginning with 1591, they would start fighting for sovereignty, and in 1648, headed under the legendary Bakhdan Khmelnytsky, what began as a small riot at first, has escalated into a full-on expulsion of the Polish from the Ukrainian lands. He managed to defeat the Polish army and make his way straight into the heart of Poland. But then he decided not to push his luck and returned home. Bogdan's dream was to create an independent Ukraine as a country of Kazakhs. But unfortunately for him, there were many adversaries for his vision. In 1654, under shadowy circumstances that still inspire conspiracies today, Bogdan accepted Moscow's suzerainty under the Periaslav Agreement. It was very clear that Bogdan did not like this agreement and quickly searched for other alternatives, trying his luck with Sweden, Transylvania, Brandenburg, Moldavia and Wallachia. But he died before he could achieve anything. His son Ivan Vukovsky ended the alliance with Moscow for him and pushed for the Treaty of Hadyakh in 1658. He basically wanted Ukraine to join as a third member of a new commonwealth with the Polish and the Lithuanians. But the Polish didn't like that. The plan became a complete failure and Ivan had to resign and flee into hiding. After that came a period of complete devastation, and by 1686 Ukraine was divided right along the Dnieper River between the Polish in the west and the Russians in the east. Basically the Slavs got tired of being bamboozled by foreign invaders and decided to bamboozle each other. As before, the Polish enforced feudalism and downgraded their peasants into serfs, and the same happened under the Tsarist regime in the east, if not worse. One of the key elements of the Tsarist regime was suppression of foreign cultures, Ukrainians were no longer seen as separate people, but more as little Russians. Basically the same thing as Russians, just a little weird and wonky. And right now I would make a pause to quickly go over the whole confusion with the Rus thing, because unfortunately this linguistic confusion has supported a lot of misunderstanding and cultural suppressions. Many people look at the word Kievan Rus and instantly assume it means Russia, which is not the case. If you can remember, the first people to be called Rus were the Varangians, aka the Vikings. It may have come from the word Rothman, which means rowing man or seafarers. After they established the rule over the Slavic tribes, every single tribe became collectively known as the people of the Rus, or Rusyny. After 1089, they would be referred in the West by a Latinized name Ruthenii, which eventually would transform into Ruthenians. In the 16th century, the word Ruthenian would become more specific to differentiate the Western Ukrainians and Belarusians from the Eastern Muscovite Russians. In fact, Galicia Volhynia would sometimes be referred to as the Ruthenian Kingdom. Eventually, after Poland came apart in the 18th century and the Russian Empire took a greater bite, some of the westernmost portions of Ukraine came under Habsburg Austria. And now, these were referred to as the Ruthenians. So yeah, in that brief explanation we just jumped over the Polish partitions. Lithuania was not a thing for a long time by now, and the lands of Ukraine, along with her sister Belarus, have become almost completely absorbed by the Russian Empire. This would continue to be for a couple hundred years until the coming of the socialists. Ethnic minorities were not the only ones fed up with the Tsarist regime. People of the lower class throughout the empire decided it was about time to end the monarchy. It was the 20th century, man, get into the swing! At first, the communist revolution appeared to be promising to the Ukrainians, as their sovereignty was starting to be recognized. But as always is the case with these movements, the whole liberty and equality thing was just a hoax to sell dictatorship. If you thought the Tsarist regime was bad, wait till you get to the socialists. Recognizing the high productivity of the Ukrainian lands, the communists quickly established hundreds of work camps and collective farms called Kalhozy to feed the country. Heavy industrialization, particularly in the Don region, has brought insane pollution to the land. All human rights were drained and the country was turned into a milking cow for the Soviet Union. Ukrainian culture was further suppressed, and if they didn't like it, in 1932, the communists established Galadomor, which was an artificial famine that devastated the people, taking almost 4 million lives. It was almost not surprising that when the Nazi Germany invaded Ukraine in 1941, 
the people at first hailed them as liberators. But the Nazi had a socialist dictatorship of their own and things didn't change for the better. German forces sucked out as much resources as they could carry shortly before being defeated by the end of the war. Ukraine didn't get a chance to breathe until Gorbachev, under whom the whole suppression thing was given a low rest. And then the fall of the USSR in 1991. Ukraine was given a choice, whether they wanted to continue living happily under Moscow's regime or become independent like some complete dorks. Much to everyone's surprise, over 90% voted for independence. Didn't see that one coming. So a new idea was passed forward. How about we we'll make the Commonwealth of Independent States, where the former states of the Soviet Union can continue as BFFs? It soon became obvious what the actual goal was, after the attempts to make one citizenship and move the military to protect the quote-unquote external borders, as if it was one big country. Oh, and of course, Moscow wanted to be in charge. Could you not be yourself? For five minutes! In my fictional world, I have a cultural group known as the Bakrans. This name comes from the word for red, which was how everybody else referred to these people, because they traditionally wear red. In my last episode, I was redrawing one of my characters in a Bakran coat. Presently, Bakrans are supposed to represent an ethnic minority, being for a long time identified by their history of suppression. While designing their cultural wear, I was inspired by the stories behind some Ukrainian styles of embroidery. How many northwestern styles have preserved the more ancient geometric styles due to their protective geography, or how the Borshev region features black embroidery in memory of a tragic historical event. The red fabric of the Bakrans, coupled with dark geometric embroidery, is a commemoration of their once great kingdom. Back then, they called themselves Velichi, meaning great. Settled upon a river network that connected hundreds of local tribes, they quickly grew in influence. Meanwhile, the mountainous rain protected them, and the abundant mines armed them with weapons of steel and gold. They continued to reign supreme over the realm for several centuries. That was until their greatest advantage, their geography, was turned against them. You see, rough terrain can provide good protection, but the rougher it becomes, the harder it is to grow anything on it. And it's not like you can eat gold. For this reason, the village depended on food imports from their neighbors. In fact, this problem is what drove the expansion in the first place. While they were doing that, they acquired many enemies. I would spare the details of how that came to be and get straight to the conclusion. The Velici eventually became completely overwhelmed and were pushed all the way back to their homeland. They were able to defend it, sure, but now they ran into three problems. They didn't have any food, they were surrounded by enemies, so no one was willing to trade with them, and it was winter. Stressed out of his mind, the last Velici king, Ratimir III, aka Ratimir the White, named so for his white beard, committed suicide, and the Velici kingdom was no more. Thank you for watching till the end, I really do appreciate it. If you like the content, make sure to press the like button and subscribe for future content. For my next video, I will do one of the two. I'll either talk about the Kazakhs, the free world horse warriors of the Slavic steppes, or begin a series of the Russian Bogatyrs, the legendary heroes of Slavic folklore. Vote in the comment section. Shout out for Lord of Maps on Instagram. Stunning work right there, hand on paper. He is currently on the project of drawing all the 50 states, so if you are interested, make sure to check him out. On the same platform, you can follow me under the name Timothy36. And with that, have a charming day, and see you in the next Sabota.